Um, once again, I'm Justine Garrett, and I'm one third of Toaster Lab. I'm very excited to introduce our first panel, Social Ghosts, which I feel like is an appropriate topic this week of uh, Halloween and All Souls. So we like to think about an idea of kind of thinning the veil um, or technological haunting when we're talking about augmented reality. And I think if you think of traditional media like a movie or a TV show as like a dream, I feel like these projects that we're going to hear about today is more like a really distinct memory that you might not be able to place. So I'm really excited to introduce uh, designer Beth Cates talking about her project, Bury the Wren, and Jane Gotch, choreographer, talking about Public Two. Daniele Bartolini, uh, director and creator, talking about The Stranger, and Sharon Reshef talking about her sound um, piece from the Prague Quadrennial, Remember Me. Um, each one of these explores um, a deeper sense of uh, personhood within a public space, and that also plays around with uh, whether or not you're existing within the realm that you think you are when you're experiencing these projects. So I'm really excited to uh, first introduce Beth Cates, who'll be joining us remotely to talk about Barry the Wren. She's coming in from, from the ether. She will appear. There she is! Mwahaha! <laughs> <clears throat> oh boy. Okay. Um, that's going to be interesting. I can totally hear myself. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm came to you from Calgary and uh, the beautiful Treaty Seven lands of Mokinsis has been stirred by uh, hundreds of generations of Blackfoot, Mississina, and Stony Nakoda and Metis, and I get to work in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains and. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be here and talk to you uh, about this pretty complex project that we did. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this all goes well. Uh, at the, there we go. Okay. There we go. So uh, I am a lighting video uh, projection, whatever you want to call it, mixed reality set and sometimes costume designer. Uh, my work has, has included uh, a, an enormous amount of technology from the days when it was actually very difficult to do to now when it's still really difficult to do, um, but is, uh, is becoming more and more of a fluid process. Barry the Wren, I'm just going to skip through. These are some images from my history. Barry the Wren was a project uh, that continues to live. Uh, it was started here at the University of Calgary with my collaborator, Neil Christensen. And uh, he and I got together uh, about two years ago and we started talking about ways that we could use emerging technology, which is what I'm here at the university looking at, ways that we could use emerging technology to tell a really compelling story while also playing with the properties that these technologies give us, these ephemeral, um, time-shifting, and, and other worldly kinds of, of spaces that we get to inhabit when we go into VR or when we add the layer of AR on top. What I was really interested in, or he was really interested in, in um, uh, shifting notions of, of reality. And so through that, we we also developed this term carbon reality in order to try to differentiate between augmented reality, virtual reality, and what we would call real reality, but everything's a reality. So we created a, a performance piece where you, uh, it was a one-on-one, -on -one. it is, because it continues to exist. Um, there we go. This is our little sizzle reel. Thank you. 
I suppose you want to hear the story. So what we did was we took a, a Vive Pro headset and we, we were playing around and we were exploring with what it was capable of um, and what it could give us to tell our particular story. And we wanted to tell, um, or what I brought to the table was the, the Donnelly story. And so the, the true story of the massacre of the Donnelly family um, that I've worked on uh, several productions of, including a production where we found uh, the wife of one of the survivors. Uh, he ended up becoming the most successful member of the family. And they, they lived their lives in the shadows of the vigilantes who murdered the family. And in this story, and the, and, and the Donnelly legend uh, has been told so many times in Canadian theater uh, and in terrible CBC movies and, and all kinds of things. Um, from there, the female perspective has never been spoken about. And so we, we also decided that uh, VR gave us a really interesting access point to the, the voice. And, um, and if we looked at ways that we could integrate both a, a, a virtual world, a performance world, and this story that is ultimately a ghost story, um, there was there was really rich territory there for us, and so what we started to to play with, and it was all developed uh, in a in a devised method, meaning that we we used our our performer. Um, we had two women work with us, Val Planche and Val Campbell, who ended up performing the piece. So you saw in that video there, and we worked with what we knew the technology was capable of and what w our plan was to pick several objects that we would then build the story from. And that came from the fact that Annie Donnelly, when she died, had her husband exhumed from the family crypt and brought a hundred kilometers away <clears throat> to London, Ontario, where they had no connections, and they are entombed in a, in a steel casket. Uh, and it was her final act of trying to, to save him. Right? That, that was my interpretation of it. The other part of that was that she, there are no artifacts of her. And I've done deep, deep research. There's, there's no photo. There's no, I have a, a document with her signature on it, but there's nothing of her. And so that fed our imagination of what was going to be in this space and that we would, we would devise the story through objects. And part of that was tied to what we wanted to do with the technology, which you can see her handing a Vive tracker here. What we wanted to do was actually um, create uh, photogrammetry, the 3D scans of real objects that she would tell the story through, that we would develop the story through, and that <clears throat> would enter into the interaction with the single participant in the room. There were several other layers to that. So these are some of our objects here that we scanned, that we brought into VR, that we then worked with dramaturgs and the performer and me and Neil as the tech, as the lead technologist, but the co-collaborator as well. And we brought all these objects into VR, um, but we created it outside of VR until our technology was ready. And we had a, a four month delay because we were, we were actually waiting for the technology to catch up a little bit to what we wanted to do. Um, and then, uh, and so your experience is entering into a, a blank theatrical space um, with nothing in it. You're put into the headset I, I then sort of do all the instructions and fix your pupillary distance and all of that stuff. And then the performance begins and the performer enters into the space with you while her world uh, 
is built within VR. And we were playing with many um, real live sounds that she was creating. So sounds of, of dresses and teapots clinking and tea pouring um, while we were also engaging you in VR with those objects. And it was all, it was all also about exploring the real time rendering capabilities of unity, which is what was driving this unity in steam VR. And so <clears throat> uh, it, the, and the approach to it was, was very theatrical within VR. Like we, went through a, a, what I would call a, a, a traditional tech process, except I had to be in VR for hours, relighting things, but telling Neil where to move the lights on objects. And we did a lot of discovery about how the audience was going to be able to interact with the objects and what thematically and, and story-wise it was, it was giving us just from being able to relight. And, and when you went into VR, it was black, and then slowly, essentially, uh, her grave emerges and she enters the room and she begins to interact with you and she, she welcomes you to her grave. She, um, she introduces the first object. And while all of this is happening, you can see now sort of a, a workshop uh, photo of it. While all of this is happening, the carbon objects plus more are being brought into the room silently by our, our ninja technicians. And <clears throat> of those objects too, there are moments in the piece where we were also playing with, with proprioception, with the idea of what's real. At no point do you see her. So she remains, while you're in VR, she remains uh, just a voice and a physical presence. And she introduces the, the virtual objects. She tells the story she, and takes the virtual objects away from you so that we can switch them. We use a lot of like sleight of hand and magician style tricks to, to distract the audience so that they looked one way. We, we, were play, we played with sound both in the headsets and in the room itself in order to create space, to create mood and to create distractions so that we could do the things like do the hard switch from the teapot to the candelabra. Um, we also then played with things like the objects in VR where um, there are sides back, there is a candelabra. The candelabra here ultimately also catches on fire in your hands. So we wanted to play to you with what was, what was um, in VR that you couldn't do in the theater. You can't put a candelabra in an audience's hands and set it on fire. It's just, we, we can't do it, but we can in VR. And that allowed us access to just some really beautiful and, and really powerful moments in the storytelling, because though the actor doesn't see the candelabra catch on fire, it's actually her, her cue, her trigger to have to tell the story of the massacre. It's the fire that that changes things, and so we 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 worked um, uh, and and yet the performer doesn't see it, right? So we were, we had to adjust our ways of working to, in order to create it uh, and to so that the performer knew what was going on as well. Um, but the and and what was interesting was that we we didn't tell audience they couldn't explore uh, but very few people explored and and about half of our audience members were experienced in VR had been in VR or AR before uh, and yet they didn't explore and we had hidden little things in the virtual world um, we had removed all gamification so you didn't you didn't have to trigger anything the performer was guiding you through the story but you did have agency to move around uh, and one person moved around and it was the person that we figured was going to um, and so then this interplay between the Carmen objects and the virtual objects in order for her to slowly essentially uh, trust the the participants so so that in terms of Annie trusting the participants so that by the time we get to the to close to the end of the story um, she is ready and yes that's a real human bone um, she is ready to reveal herself and and 
So technologically, so the Vive Pro headsets, the cameras, the pass-through cameras that are in them that allow you to do AR uh, are not of a very high resolution. And so what we decided was that rather than try to uh, ignore it or just let it be, we would actually embrace it. And we added several filters to give her the quality of, of a daguerreotype photo, which is the very first image that we are introduced to in the very first object with the wedding portrait. And so to, to use what the technology had to give us at this point in time, um, to then allow it to affect uh, the image that we were bringing forward. And this was the stage two where she finally, you finally see her, you're finally reconnected with a sense of yourself because uh, you can see your hands through the pass-through camera. So it's seeing everything and, and you can now see that the room has been altered that we've added objects to it that you experienced in VR. So. We wanted to remain still in this liminal space of, is it is it real? Is it not real? Is she here? I can feel her. I can see her. She, but she's ghostly. Um, she's. We wanted to keep everyone off kilter because the big, what I think is the big payoff is the moment where um, she then removes the headset from the participant. And there's a final exchange um, between her and the participants where she, she thanks you for listening and she then hands you a very, very real apple that you can, that's yours, you can eat it. Um, and we give people a, a couple of minutes in the room to then explore the carbon objects to, to, to restore themselves almost everyone that she removed the headset from was in tears by the end of it, um, which is a testament to her performance. Uh, and I think speaks to this, this deep intimacy and, uh, and transportative quality of, of VR and AR and what we have access to in a performative sense. Um, and, uh, and then she leaves the room you then get your time in the room and we had one further step to where we had taken a picture of everyone at the beginning because this was a research project and we needed to measure people's pupils during all of this show while we're running the sound and the light and the and the vr cues uh, we're also photoshopping you into a portrait of her so it looks like you're now uh, very similar to the wedding portrait that you saw at the beginning. Um, it looks like you're, you had this moment with her posed for a photograph that, that didn't actually exist in the way, and there's me with Annie, uh, in the way that uh, there are no photographs of her and she is a, a spirit. Um, and that, very quickly, very briefly, is, is what we did. Oh, and this is our, one of our dramaturgs. That was really interesting. In another scenario, I would talk about how we dramaturged in VR because it was a, a, a familiar, but very different process. And it required um, some, some building of some interesting new tools and skills uh, to deal with the dramaturgy of this. So thank you. I think I hit my 10 minutes. Stage, uh, Jane Gotch to talk about public too. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, the, mm, the project is called Public Square, uh, but I know it's tough to, to type. Um, it was a public performance along the streetcar line in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, the cast was Trina Warren, Leo Gaiden, Tristan Griffin. Uh, the choreography was by myself in collaboration with the dancers, and it was sh the cinematography, editing, uploading to online uh, was conducted by Ian Garrett. Um, the premise of the project was how we can, how public art can investigate in the way like a microscope, directing attention towards overlooked and mundane locales within a city. 
the performer's body becomes something between an expressive artistic tool and a medium, embodying qualities of both camera and canvas. As artists, we generate a conceptual feedback loop by documenting and describing the environment's history, architectural features, and inhabitants while simultaneously inhabiting and becoming new history and architecture. It created an indelible memory on the location for all who witness and take part. Public Squared went a step further and reimagined what public space is through the medium of VR, expanding how it is created and accessed within a city, further establishing that public space isn't just a segment of land designated by a city planner or council, but it is a mindset shared by the inhabitants who occupy that public space, literally the ground they're standing on. The project led by example in content and in the way the audience interfaced with it. Public Squared, Public Squared made space for the audience to also believe that they have permission to create and play in Kansas City. The project consisted of three VR videos, one at three different stops along the streetcar line, and one live performance that take, took place at the main Union Station. The VR videos were accessed on a dedicated website and an online map of each of the three video locations. Um, it was funded by a public grant from Art in the Loop and the Kansas City Downtown Council. Um, the project was made very quickly. We had about two months from uh, receiving the grant to when the videos had to be up and running. So as opposed to the other projects that have been discussed so far, it was kind of down and dirty. Um, out, Outside of a one-day play date with Ian and a VR camera, uh, this was my first VR choreographic project. Um, a few things went right. Uh, <laughs> the community involvement that happened due to rehearsing, shooting, and being in public space was really fantastic. We became good friends with a lot of the streetcar conductors and uh, riders. Um, we worked together uh, collectively to think outside of any boxes that we were choreographically and conceptually placing ourselves in. Uh, but mostly the success of it was learning from all the things that didn't really turn out well. Um, as one of my favorite uh, oblique strategies cards states, honor thy error as hidden intention. Um, VR can be a vehicle for many forms of art and performance, but what I've learned is it really is a medium unto itself. Um, last week I recently learned to scuba dive, and at 70 feet down at the bottom of the ocean, the world feels very different. Your perception of space, of rhythm, um, how your body feels in space is really different. I kind of feel like VR is sort of similar. Um, creating in virtual space is not like creating in a physical reality rhythm depth of field and what the um, and the specificity of gesture all changes i've really spent about 20 years of my career working in site specific and responsive performance installations it's my thing uh, and i thought applying what i've learned over these years to vr would feel really natural and easy and it wasn't um, at one of the locations it was a large open plaza with skywalks and crosswalks uh, crossing the intersection. And I, as a live performance, it would have been a really interesting um, space for the audience to navigate visually, watching performers cross through these spaces, using space and depth in a quite unique way. Uh, but with the VR camera, you couldn't see anything at all. So we spent about five hours videoing that and none of the footage was usable. Uh, you couldn't even make out something that happened across the street. So we began working closer to the camera, but the performers really struggled with perceiving how they would appear and feel like to the VR audience. Um, they were concerned about hitting, literally hitting the camera and struggled with orientating themselves and front towards the camera as they moved around it. And because rendering takes so long, it wasn't possible for them to watch what we had filmed, so they had to wing it. Um, 
the space in which you can compose in is really reduced, and obviously there is no front. Um, off, often dancers use depth of field and distant from, distance from an audience to direct what is the focal point in live performance, and that is in a way taken away in VR. Questions that came up is how can we direct the audience's eyes and positioning them through space in VR? How do dancers hold space in VR when they may not be the main focus? And how do they do this while still maintaining presence? We also struggled with the scope of the current technology, um, mostly the internet speed. Unless the viewer logged on to the free Wi-Fi provided at the stops and downloaded the YouTube app, the streaming was painfully slow. There was just so many steps it took to just watch. Uh, even with that, we had about 200 viewers that jumped through the hoops. <laughs> Um, because it was a free public installation, the viewers were watching through their cell phones rather than through VR headsets. So even less was visually, um, visually uh, seeable. The funding and the presenting organization was thrilled to have a VR project as part of the summer festival. I believe it was the first VR project in Kansas City, or at least art-based. Um, but they struggled with promotion. They tried to advertise it in the same way they did the live performances and the visual art installations. Uh, decals were placed on the ground, as you see here. Unfortunately, most of the people didn't see them. Uh, not enough promotion was done via email and social media. And I feel that if more projects in the festival use technology, the festival may have developed a larger resource and presence for accessing the work online. Uh, but really what it came down to was word of mouth, so kind of as low tech as you can get. Um, all things I would keep in the mind in the future is to add budget to my, to supplement my budget to add to what the presenters may not um, know they would need to do to get people to access the work. Um, all in all, I feel like I got my feet wet with VR and I want to do it again, which is great. Uh, I feel that there really is for me an important research and project using VR and that Public Square got me one step closer to finding what that is for me uh, and that really experience is your best teacher. So you just have to work with the, with the medium, with the camera, with the footage. Um, I would say to be prepared to rewrite the standards you work by. That there really is a learning curve and I found it to be steep, but I feel like the payoff for artists, for the public, and for the growth of this technology is worth it. Thank you. introduce Daniele Bartolini talking about The Stranger. Good morning. I'm Daniele Bartolini from Dopo Lavoro Teatrale. And I have a video that I want to show you just to begin. Yes, I'm here for the package.
Um, thank you, guys. I apologize that there are lots of press quotes because it's a promotional video uh, that I use for, for pitches usually, but I think it kind of like uh, give a sense of what the practice is with, um, uh, that I do with my company. And I'm here to talk to you about The Stranger today, and I would like to talk a lot about the process that we did with Toaster Lab for the last iteration of the show that we had. So The Stranger is a show that is designed for an audience of one that is lost uh, in the urban landscape. And um, the audience of one is left, uh, that's how the piece begins, it's uh, you're left on your own at an intersection. Uh, you have no information about the piece, you just know that you have to uh, meet, meet with someone, but you don't know who. And I think that this is uh, uh, the, I think it's kind of like one of the key points of my work which is actually um, the absolute uh, subtraction sometimes that I think achieves actually an activation of every element of the city. So if I would have to speak about um, augmented reality, which I'm not an expert, but in, sometimes the process that I've activated in order to uh, augment reality is actually su to subtract all of the elements of theater. So we're speaking about um, costumes, we're speaking about uh, you know, actors that you recognize uh, down the street. So that in that moment, if you uh, find yourself to be uh, going you know, to work or getting a coffee with a friend, you're actually in the piece because the audience is uh, left in a, suspense, in a uh, suspended, wondering who's, uh, who's the person that they have to encounter. Um, the Stranger relates to my personal experience. I think that's also why the, the show is designed for an audience of one. It's because... Um, I come from Italy, and I found myself originally, uh, when I first immigrated to Canada, to, I found myself often on my own, working, uh, walking on the streets and being, you know, curious. So at a certain point, I, I thought that this could, uh, could become a piece, and not only, I later found out that uh, there are many shows that I've done so far, but this is kind of like what I insist in searching. It's um, the audience having a freedom of agency around the public space and around the city so that the show becomes really an act of reappropriation of the public space. And it comes with, uh, it's a funny relationship, I think, with technology because uh, um, technology is great because it allows myself, you know, to speak with my family, for example, back in Italy anytime I want, but at the same time, I don't need to tell you that it isolates us, right? So the, the show, it's also an attempt to put away your phone and actually reconnect with your surroundings. Um, so The Stranger, um, the dramaturgy that we have, it's uh, composed by lots of questions, and we call our work audience-specific, because it's really driven by the audience, and we try as much as possible to make the audience a part of the narrative that they experience, to a certain point that sometimes the, the, the show becomes really a platform for the self-expression of the audience. And um, I think about three years ago, in 2016, Ian and I uh, met. Uh, it wasn't our uh, idea originally to meet, but it was Michael Rubenfeld who encouraged us to, to get together. Because um, um, one, a few problems, I would say, that come with my work is that um, it's, um, it's not really sustainable on many levels. Because we only have, we perform for eight hours and then we have uh, um, probably 11 audience members, you know, that go through, through the show. So at a certain point we were reflecting on the producing model and we, and we thought that maybe a way to disseminate the work it could be through VR technology. So that's how originally we started and using the dramaturgical structures, we, we've been doing lots of experiments. Um, and I think we found out that probably the dramaturgy that we create, it's, it, it's, it's good. In, uh, I mean, it's good. I would say it, it's good to be in a dialogue with the with this kind of technology. Um, so the idea that, that we followed at the beginning was to take segments of the show of the stranger, to have the actors uh, performing their scene in front of the camera, because we were trying to achieve this idea of uh, although you could not interact because you didn't have the privilege of like responding, which is the the main characteristic of my shows. Um, you were still immersed somehow, and you had the trying to reach this feeling that this thing is happening really for you and in that moment. 
so this uh, October, uh, we actually had a new edition of the show, The Stranger, that we brought back. That for the first time was uh, uh, created for two audience members at a time. And that's when we, um, we had the idea of actually putting, you know, some of the research that we've done with Toaster Lab over the course of these years in, uh, in the show. And um, the process has been uh, really interesting because actually we didn't end up doing anything that we, were, we had done before in the sense of performance speaking with the audience, but we ended up doing a silent, uh, almost like a silent short movie. Uh, that unfort is, it is it going to be possible to see it today at some point or no? Probably not, okay. I'll try to describe it to you. Um, so the idea is kind of like that you are uh, fully immersed in a 360 uh, setting. And you have, the way that we have, we've created this, uh, this subplot of three women, uh, which kind of like hold the, the earth together. They're kind of like protectors of the earth and they're mothers of one child, just on a metaphoric level. But the piece, um, it unfolds with them um, having constantly the three performers around you doing this action. So I think I found myself watching the movie over and over and actually you could watch it. Like I think it's something that is very interesting about um, this technology is that it allows you to experience something many times, even if it's not live. And I found myself even being the creator, like watching, being focused on all, you can watch the movie only being focused on one specific performers. And uh, it's kind of like a, almost infinite than the movement that you can do um, in, between, uh, in between every section of, of the show. And um, I think that uh, often I, I've seen that, uh, um, the VR technology for the, I don't know a lot about the technology, but what I've seen is that it's used almost like as the beginning, as it was used in the beginning of cinema to create like an effect that almost like uh, surprises you, almost like a magic. Uh, what I'm interested in, in using uh, VR, it's mostly actually in, create, in trying to create intimacy with the audience and also um, to generate, that's what in the show really did, I think to generate like a, an introspective journey for the audience, because that's how The Stranger was, uh, was, um, was really, th that edition of The Stranger was really more of a meditation. And I think that the VR technology actually, like to put uh, the VR set and to really allow the audience to really go within themselves even more. So I'm just um, curious about experimenting more and uh, to be working again with Toaster Lab and thank you so much for, for your time listening. I'm happy to introduce Sharon Reshef talking about her project, uh, Remember Me. Good morning, I am Sharon Reshef and I am thrilled to be speaking to you all today about my sound project, Remember Me. Remember Me is an interactive app based to make sure it's there, app-based sonic experience that guides participants on an auditory journey through a landscape. The app archives binaural recordings and photographs of myself listening at multiple locations throughout the landscape. Participants can journey to these locations, orient themselves according to the photographs, and listen with their own headphones to the correlating recording. Remember Me is an auditory voyage through time and space, transporting its participants to the past through a sonic portal. Remember Me was part of the 2019 Prague Quadrennial, an international festival of scenography and design. Being part of the site-specific exhibition that was held at the Prague Ex Exhibition Grounds, Remember Me archived the sonic environment of these grounds prior to the festival in an immersive and interactive app. The rich sonic history embedded in the grounds is unearthed when participants listen to the recordings and recognize that this land soundscape has a story to tell. The Remember Me app was developed in correlation with Toaster Lab. Toaster Lab was incredible to work with. They listened to my ideas for the app and brought it to life on an accessible platform where I was able to contribute content and further explore the design of the app. Toaster Lab was able to support my project by making the app run without data or Wi-Fi to accommodate the majority of international people on a limited data plan and by providing the content in a simple and organized fashion. 
Here is a screenshot from the Remember Me app that displays an aerial map of the exhibition grounds with the exact pinpoints of each location where recordings were taken. The map can be zoomed in and out to help participants orient themselves in the grounds. The content related to each of the locations were captured a week prior to the festival to emphasize that these are soundscapes of the past. By listening to audio recordings of the past, even from a week ago, it elicits participants to imagine the deep and rich sonic history rooted in the landscape. During this time, my photographer and audio engineer, Alec Hussey, and I explored the grounds through our ears, stopping to listen and capture sonic moments, ultimately choosing locations based on sound. The recordings captured the mundane everyday life that build and add to the rich history of the, Bra of the Prague exhibition grounds. When a red circle is clicked, a pop-up displays a binaural recording, a photograph, and a date and time stamp. For those unfamiliar with binaural recording, it is done with binaural microphones. The device has two microphones that are attached to earphones, and each earphone is placed in the ears of the individual recording. I wore these binaural microphones to capture the sonic land from my perspective to create a spatialized 3D sound sensation. Participants were able to listen to the recorded environment with headphones, exactly as I did on that day, at that time, and in that spot. Using binaural microphones to capture the soundscapes added to the immersive experience, for it fabricated the past in the present. The ears travel to the past, but the body remains in the present. With time and deed stamps, the participants were made aware that these recordings are preserving sonic moments of the land. The intent of the project was to demonstrate the fleetingness of sound that holds historical content of, the, of an environment. By archiving and preserving these sounds that may never perform again can be revisited, reheard, and remembered. Here's just a close up. Since the sound was captured through my ears, the position of my body during the recording became important to the listening experience of the participants. By photographing myself listening in each location, participants were able to push in themselves, according to the photograph, to fully immerse their ears and body into the sounds of the past. The photographs also aided the participants in identifying the exact spot within the locations. During the festival, there was an opportunity to document and to promote the project. I performed with a group of participants moving and listening to multiple locations together. Here are a few photos from this spot. And here is another example of another location. You can see the time and date stamps, a close up, and people participating. Now here's another one. This, is the lo this location is the only one within a structure. This was the industrial, yeah. This was the industrial palace where many international installations and projects were displayed and was a headquarters for the festival. I wanted to capture this location because of the drastic alterations that would be evident during the festival. The sounds of the festival were hev heavily present, making the juxtaposition with the past more powerful. It also gave an opportunity to document the creation of this international festival. Um, and here's a space during the festival with participants. Uh, you can imagine lying in the space that is heavily occupied with people and art while listening to the same space, yet empty. The recording highlighted the sounds of an historical architectural space as it was being prepared and transformed into a historical international event. Here is a location where weather had a strong impact on the experience. When the recording was taken, it was heavily raining. The binaural recording captured the rain droplets hitting my head that was covered with a rain jacket, emphasizing the sound of impact. Here, during the festival, two participants listened to the recording during a warm, bright day. No rain, yet while listening to the recording, a cocoon of rain surrounds their heads. And here's another photo of other participants. This location had distinct human activity when it was recorded. There was music playing from the little amusement park, students on a field trip giggling and speaking Czech, and a garbage trunk honking. The recording captured a story that was unique to that day, that time, and that location. 
Here are two individuals listening to the same recording as they are surrounded with other people and other vehicles. It brought these de delightful moments of parallel between the recorded past and the present. As a child from the recording walks by on your left, it is synchronized with a child passing by on your left in the present. To experience the Remember Me app that archives the sounds of the Prague Exhibition Grounds, you can visit my website at shronreshef.com slash remember dash me. Information on downloading the app is available for Android and Apple users and offers an EPUB interactive file. Remember Me emphasizes the immersive sensation of listening to the past in its or or originating location. The experience connects participants with their surrounding environment by focusing and emphasizing the landscape's fleeting soundscape. The sounds are indigenous to these environments and to this time are digitally preserved. Even though these recordings captured the mundane everyday life, they demonstrate the worth and importance of preserving sounds that one day may never perform again. These oral records remind us that our land has a past with monumental memories and a voice with a story to tell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome. Um, I'm happy to open that up to questions now if people in the audience have anything that they'd like to ask uh, these artists. If not, I can fulfill my lifelong dream of being Oprah Winfrey and begin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Daniele, I wanted to ask you, um, and Beth as well, in creating this notion of uh, a really customized theater for one experience. Um, did you think about how you wanted the participants to essentially socialize with the information you gave them afterwards? Was there an intended impact that you meant to have on their lives after they experienced this? Or was it um, intended to be a sort of contained impact? Um, I think that actually um, the, the work is always like on the line of uh, Many times, like the audience members, is confused whether the piece is over or not. Mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, we, since you're taken care of and you move, you know, from place to place, and you have different encounters, encounters with different artists. Then, for example, sometimes we leave the audience in another location and nobody arrives. Mm -hmm. um, but you're in a location that it's highly, you know, populated in that moment. There could be a train station, so there is actually lots of people, and it's an invitation again to relate with the with the environment differently and since you've talked to you know strangers throughout the piece we invite you to to talk to keep talking to strangers and uh, in the, that I would say it's probably like the um, the one if you want to say message that there is in, in the piece because other than that it's only like being present it requires the presence of the performer with their body, and at the same time, since the audience is transforming to actor, it requires the performance of the, the, the body participation, you know, um, almost if they were an actors of the audience members as well. And, um, and that's why I think also in, in the VR, um, when in the thing that we collaborated and created together, we, we actually didn't want to have a, like a, a plot or something that was actually told, but we wanted you the audience, since you were receiving mostly in that moment, to make, to recompose the puzzle of the, of, uh, of the story that you could have interpreted in different ways. Beth, did you hear my question initially? She's smiling. She's a lovely smile. <laughs> Blink if they have you. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. We'll come back to you, Beth. Oh, you're with us. You're moving now. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you, yeah, I don't think the connection is totally stable. Okay. Um, Jane, I really loved your presentation too because you 
you really laid it out there in terms of like this stuff just was very challenging and didn't work. Um, and did you want to talk at all about what you're hoping to experiment next in terms of uh, working with the technology further? Because you mentioned the sort of a hopefulness at the end. Yeah, I guess um, very similar to what you were speaking of is how I, I've produced as well um, one person performances, one audience performances, and there is an unsustainability to that. And how this could be used uh, and allow performance to run over longer periods of time. Um, I'm also training in something called somatic experiencing, which is a trauma resolution work, that one of the things when we are under stress or encounter stressors is that our, our eye, our our people's narrow and our focus goes in one direction um, to be aware of that stress. And I, I feel like VR is a way that we can in, literally to the most basic encourage movement of a person and how that, how by putting um, the work in their hands in a way that they have access to the timing or as you said, like repeating that there's infinite ways to watch it, really creates a way to have a, have a deeper sense of safety with work and ultimately safety with uh, relationship to others and using VR as a way to um, pattern new ways of relationship to both others and people and to place or our city. Are there any audience questions? Yes. So, right in the middle. Okay. Right, yeah, right there. Um, why you chose VR for this project? Do you think, like, was it the best medium for it? And if it was, why? Or was the motivation more just to interact with that kind of technology and explore it? Uh, yeah, there was a few reasons. Um, I had met Ian about a year prior, and as I said, I've done a, a lot of site-specific work that was one audience-focused. So when I started to speak with Ian about what he had been doing, it seemed like um, not that far of a jump from what I had been doing already, and I, I still feel that. Um, there is just a lot more to to learn. <laughs> um, I also in that time moved to Toronto from the States, but want to still have a presence in the art community there. So this uh, funding opportunity came up and it felt like a way that I could be making and part of work that's being made there without living there full time. So the project was rehearsed in about two weeks and uh, filmed very quickly, about three days. Right in the middle there. What is the range in terms of the revenue that you're needing to, to get in order to develop your platforms? And I'm curious how they maybe differ if some of you are more using more open source versus I'm just about done now. So using open source versus that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Doing it from scratch, the code. So the question was um, the projects in this panel of a range of timelines and questions about revenue and infrastructure to support the creation of that work. If they could talk a little bit about that. I personally operate on a project base. Is, I, I hope I'm answering the question. I operate on a project base and I produce my own work and so it's always um, finding a, a number of, uh, of partners that can sometimes provide with space, sometimes with little money. And um, I actually have the tendency of uh, um, intending like a, a series of shows becoming like one larger project. So even like uh, the process of rehearsing a show, it becomes like um, it's work that it's right now, but it's also works that can enter in uh, in future um, pieces of mine, and um, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty independent and uh, small scale, 
And um, lots of times on my end, uh, of course, I pay myself, but it's really a work of labor. Uh, sorry, of love at the same time. A work of labor, of course, but of love too. <laughs> Intentional shit. Yeah. Did you have a follow up back there? For a single piece, yeah. I'm in between sixty and eighty thousand. It depends, like uh, what kind of like projects we're looking at, and sometimes it varies. Like I, it really varies, like from project to project. Sometimes it's only a few thousands of dollars. Um, yeah. I think to to answer that question too, like in each of these uh, projects didn't didn't necessarily have their own app uh, with it. So, uh, Beth, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so I wanted to direct this question to Beth, too, because you were talking about it as uh, Bury the Wren as a research project. Um, we had originally had a question about it being intended um, as a, a theater for one and whether or not you had some a focused intention coming out of that. But the other question we're just hearing now is about sources of revenue and budgeting for these types of experiences. Okay, I think I got all of it. <laughs> um, can you just repeat the, the, the first thing of the, the internet project? So the initial question, there were two questions that um, we wanted to hear from you about, which was the intention as an outcome of theater for one, and then what is your infrastructure and revenue structure for supporting this kind of work? If you can hear me. Yeah, I got that. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start with number two. So number two, in terms of the infrastructure, um, because this was a research project and a thesis project at the University of Calgary, supported by the, the university and the Department of Drama and the School for the Performing Arts. So um, a lot of the technology was, was there. I would say if I were to cost it, it would have been about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in in technology and, and resources and then the the uh, the ever-changing fees. I mean, we had a, an equity actor, and, and Neil and I, and two dramaturgs. So, and sixty thousand is probably about right. Um, in terms of the the intention, um, we've come out of it certainly to explore expanding the one-on capacity uh, and can we can we uh, continue to uh, uh, have the same kind of intimacy and the same kind of storytelling as we expand uh, the technology because we know we can support m multiple so-called players multiple participants uh, it would just require a different a different um, approach to it and so the intention going into it was very much a one-on-one -on -one. it was inspired by theater replacements, bio boxes, it was inspired by uh, instant performance and the goal was never to do anything more than one, but we certainly come out of it and to, uh, to, to also move it into other platforms, make it more portable and make it more accessible for more than one person. Thank you. Sharon, did you want to talk about, Sharon and Jane, talk about the funding and infrastructure for your projects as well? Yeah, sure. Um, mine was heavily uh, collaborated with Toaster Lab in that sense on the app side, uh, which was amazing. Uh, so it was more of like a case study for Toaster Lab, so I didn't have to deal with that financial side, which was a blessing. Um, and for the timeline, I was there for a week before the PQ started, um, which I felt was like a short amount of time, but it was sufficient enough because I got a lot of content that I was happy with. Um, and I was able to control the experience in the sense that there was one recording per uh, location, so it doesn't overwhelm the 
participant with like so many archival sounds um, to do it again or to explore it further in tr new locations, I would definitely try to expand my timeline um, and offer um, a longer period for myself to explore this space so weather becomes more of an impact and seasons and time and everything changing. Um, Public Square received a $10,000 grant uh, and that that was it. There was no ticket prices. It was a free, that was part of the grant stipulation was it was free. Um, and the dancers were paid below a uh, living wage to participate, but did also as a labor of love. Uh, and that money went really fast. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the tricky things is that you can, what I'm hearing too about these projects is that you can use them as a foundation to iterate again, even though, and build on the money that you've already spent. So it might not necessarily be like one fixed amount that you can say is per project necessarily. Were there other audience questions before we, yeah. Yeah, so I think something that's like a, a core value of what we're doing with Toaster Lab and that's really supported by the Digital Strategy Fund, which we receive from the Canada Council for the Arts, is that we are hoping to not only create open source um, code for the for a platform for other artists to use too, we have sort of micro um, grants and funding to support and essentially move projects forward using the technology and the expertise that we already have. And we don't necessarily intend for the symposium to be like, an, a, like a day long commercial for Toaster Lab, which I guess I'm fine with if we do it that way. But um, like one of our values is to essentially impart this technology, which can be kind of a high barrier, even though the individual pieces of technology aren't necessarily like very expensive to buy. Like, the expertise in using them and the expertise in coding is hard to come by, like in a short amount of time if you have a limited budget. So that's what we're, that's kind of the model we're working on. Yes, Andrew and Ian? Yes. Sorry, I also don't want to make this a commercial for anything, but um, but uh, two of the projects were actually built using the map tool, which I mentioned in the beginning. Yes. Um, so nice to meet you, Sharon, finally. We've never <laughs> met. <laughs> But, and, and thank you very much for the endorsement. But we are actually, like, uh, part of our mission is to try to solve, again, at least some of this problem. It's a really big problem. Yeah. But to see if we can, as, as Justine said, scaffold some of this technology out so that we can, of course, lower the cost, but also uh, build on our own expertise as a community. Because we encounter this technology, and then I'll stop talking, but we encounter this technology in a very different way than the industry ever will. Um, what we're doing right. with it and what we're pushing is completely different. So. We have time for one more question before we break for lunch. Will it be you? Will can it I, be me? Yeah, you want to say something? Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for Ian and Toaster Lab, like, I wouldn't have even been able to play around. Like, like, like let alone make a project. Like, that learning curve of just even getting the video from the camera to a computer, and then the massive amount of time it takes to edit, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's what, I mean, I think that's what we're promoting here, too, is the collaborative aspect, which you wouldn't necessarily find in a, like, sort of commercial gaming environment that's competitive and for-profit, although money's nice. More money's always good. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I want to say thank you so much to our panel and to Beth for joining us from far away and to Daniele and Jane and Sharon for um, speaking about their really exciting and inspiring projects today. So thank you. Just wanted to reaffirm lunch is on your own and we'll reconvene at 1.30 for our next panel. And if you need some lunch ideas, please um, consult with one of our folks in the lobby. Yeah, that was so good.